My name's Ed Fuller. I'm an associate professor at Penn State and associate director uh, for policy and advocacy for UCEA. And I'm the MC this afternoon or this morning. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, doc Dr. Michael Dumas from New York University and who will introduce our speaker. Hopefully I got that right. Okay. Hello, good morning. So we're excited to have Dr. Michael Omi here as our keynote. Um, given our theme this year, we could think of no one better suited to actually help us bring some of these ideas together. Michael Omi is a professor of ethnic studies and the associate director of the Haas Center, I'm sorry, the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at the University of California, Berkeley. He is also a founding member of the faculty steering committee of the Center for New Racial Studies, which is a University of California multi-campus research project based at UC Santa Barbara. Professor Omi is the co-author of Racial Formation in the United States, a groundbreaking work that transformed how we understand the social and historical forces that give race its changing meaning over time and place. The third edition of the book was released in July of this year. If, how many of you have read Racial Formation in the United States at some point or another, exactly? Um, and the first edition was in the 80s, and then there was one in uh, about 94, I believe, and then it took another 20 years, and we now have their kind of, <laughs> their latest sense of like, well, where are we now in terms of race? So it's a very um, important work, um, and I encourage all of you, even if you weren't in a sociology program or took a sociology course, to certainly read that work. Since 1995, uh, Dr. Omi has been the co-editor of the book series on Asian American history and culture at Temple University Press. Since 2002, he has served on the project advisory board on race and human variation for the American Anthropological Association that resulted in the current traveling museum exhibit, Race, Are We So Different?, which has been displayed in over 35 cities and was on display here in DC at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in 2011. Professor Omi is a recipient of UC Berkeley's Distinguished Teaching Award, an honor bestowed on only 240 Berkeley faculty members since the award's inception in 1959. And as a great teacher, um, we're excited to have him here. Um, Dr. Omi. take off my watch and carefully police my time here. Welcome, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Ed Fuller and I'd particularly like to thank uh, Michael Dumas for extending the invitation to uh, speak today. And also some of the UCEA staff people, particularly uh, Leva Pitts and Angel Nash for their help in just getting me organized. And a round of applause is certainly the way. I particularly am uh, very honored to be here to talk to you. Uh, I'm, I really commend the organization for the theme of uh, writing civil wrongs to look at the persistence of racial disparities, particularly in education, and the ways to challenge it. Uh, what I'm gonna do today is actually to interrogate uh, the concept of race itself as part of a kind of conversation of uh, what we mean by race and what we might not mean by race. And let me get my clicker out. Uh, way back in uh, 1993, uh, my favorite Clinton, who's funk master George Clinton, uh, <laughs> urged folks uh, to paint the White House black. And in 2008, what was a, once a hip hop fantasy became a reality. And in the immediate wake of Barack Obama's election, many observers were quick to claim that the United States was now a colorblind post-racial society. After Obama's State of the Union speech in January 2010, MSNBC host Chris Matthews said, and I love his quote, he said, he, Obama, is post-racial by all appearances. I forgot he was black tonight for an hour. Surprised it was a whole hour. <laughs> 
But before we celebrate the triumph of colorblindness, perhaps a bit of perspective is warranted. A reporter once told Malcolm X that the passage of civil rights legislation was clear proof, clear proof that things were getting better for blacks. And in response, Malcolm X said, it did not show an improvement to stick a knife nine inches into someone, pull it out six inches, and call it progress. But some people, Malcolm X observed, don't even want to admit the knife is there. And that's our problem today. Many people believe that the goals of the civil rights movement have been achieved, that racial discrimination is a thing of the past, and that we are now truly a colorblind society. Colorblindness denies that race informs our perceptions, shapes our attitudes and influences our individual, our collective and institutional practices. An attendant to this reigning ideology of colorblindness is the belief that the most effective anti-racist gesture, policy, or practice is simply to ignore race. So while the prevailing racial ideology of colorblindness exhorts us to get beyond race, debates about the systems of racial classification we employ, the meanings we ascribe in daily and institutional life to racial categories, and their use in social and scientific analysis and policy formation remain ongoing and unsettled in a supposedly post-racial era. This is what I want to explore with you today and hopefully provoke a discussion about the very meaning and use of race in racial classification. Um, the conceptual framework I employ is uh, the notion of racial formation. And in brief, racial formation is the uh, process, the social historical process of race making and its impact throughout the social order. And in saying that, I mean to say that race making is fundamentally a process of othering, of defining and categorizing people as other. And it's obviously not restricted to distinctions based on race. Our principles around othering extend to gender, class, sexuality, religion, culture, language, nationality, and age. Among other perceived differences are frequently evoked to justify structures of inequality, differential treatment, subordinate status, and in some cases, violent conflict and war. Classifying people by different perceived attributes is really a universal phenomenon. As social beings, we utilize forms of racial of classification as a whole to navigate the world, to quickly discern who may be friend or foe, and to provide clues and to guide our social interactions with individuals and the groups that we encounter. Now, the very act of defining racial groups is a process, I would argue, that is fraught with confusion, with contradiction, and with unintended consequences. Any definition can prove to be ephemeral, and supposed boundaries shift, slippages occur, realignments become evident, and in fact, new collectivities emerge. Government definitions, for example, of race, which I'll get to in a sec, have varied widely across time and place. In the early 20th century America, for example, it was possible actually to change one's race simply by crossing state lines. Historical shifts in scientific knowledge in fields ranging from physical anthropology and the genomic sciences fuel debates about what race may mean or not mean as an indicator of human variation. And while such debates and reformulations regarding the concept of race initially occur in specific institutional arenas, in public spaces, or in academic fields, there are consequences are often very dramatic and reverberate throughout society. Now, race-based or state-based, rather, racial classifications are never stable and are subject to challenges by individuals and groups who contest existing definitions, make claims for the recognition of new ones, or argue for ways to achieve more congruence and alignment between state definitions and individual collective self-definitions. Now, my initial interest in um, 
state definitions of race was uh, the Susie Gilbrey Phipps case in Louisiana in the early 1980s, which went to trial in the early 80s, and many people may be familiar with this case. Um, it started back in 1977 when a woman named Susie Gilbrey Phipps, who was then 43 years old, found herself in need of a birth certificate in order to process a passport application. It was the first time actually she was going to leave the country. She never applied for a passport before. Needed it, couldn't find her birth certificate, and goes down to the Louisiana or New Orleans Division of Vital Records. Now, believing all her life that she was white, imagine her surprise when a clerk at the New Orleans Division of Vital Records shows that on her reissued birth certificate, she is designated as black. Quoting Ms. Phipps, it shocked me. I was sick for three days. I was brought up white. I married white twice. Now, at issue was actually a 1970 law. And I want to emphasize this. I'm not talking 1790, 1890. I'm talking 1990. Louisiana state law that allowed for anyone with more than 132nd black blood to be legally defined by the state as black. And in fact, the, flip, uh, the Phipps trial, it's really complicated. It goes all the way up to the state, uh, Louisiana State Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court re, uh, affirms the right of the state to make that determination. And in the state's genealogical investigations, Ms. Phipps is found to be 330 seconds black. And hence, she will be issued a birth certificate that says she's black. The point here is that these designation of racial categories and the determination of racial identity is really no simple task. And over the last several centuries, it has provoked numerous debates in this country, among others intense debates over natural and legal rights, over who could become a citizen, and indeed, who can marry whom. It's worth remembering that it wasn't until 1952 that race could no longer be used to deny an individual the right to naturalization in the United States. 1952. And it wasn't until 1967, as most of us know, in the Loving decision that the Supreme Court invalidated laws prohibiting interracial marriage. 1967. You know what's more shocking? This is a little footnote. But Alabama's interracial marriage laws was not repealed until the year 2000. And in a statewide vote, 41% of Alabama voters wanted to actually maintain the ban. So in thinking about how race, the determination of race, and the, ra the ways in which race affects these kinds of uh, laws, these kinds of policies and decisions, is very important to note that it still kind of resonates in the contemporary period. Now, racial and ethnic categories in the United States have been historically shaped by political and social agendas. Mm, let's see here. Um, of particular times. Uh, and there's actually been very shifting racial terms throughout the course of the 20th century in the US Census. I got this off of a uh, demographer, Wren, Wren Farley. Um, you might want to note here, let's see, that among other things, you could see that uh, at the beginning of the century, there were relatively few racial categories. But past 1970, particularly with the passage and institutionalization of a number of civil rights laws, you see an expanding number of categories of racial and ethnic groups. There's some curious ones here, too. Actually, the, uh, in terms of names, the only consistent designators <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the 20th century have been uh, white, Chinese, and Japanese. In that respect is interesting. Uh, the term, oops, I got to go back. The um, term Mexican as a racial category was used only once and that was in 1930, and subsequently revoked uh, after uh, objection on the part of the Mexican government and also on the part of Mexican Americans here in the United States. Um, let's see, you'll notice here earlier on there was a mixed race category called mulatto. One of my favorites is the term Hindu here, which was in use in 1930 and 1940. Um, Hindu was trying to track the number of South Asian or Asian Indians in the United States. Although it's using a kind of religious designator, Hindu, uh, what's more ironic is that the uh, largest population of Asian Indians in the United States during that time was actually uh, uh, Sikh, and secondly, Muslim, 
and third, Hindu. Nonetheless, Hindu becomes coded as a kind of racial category, if you will. But uh, one can see through this thing is the kind of inconsistency and really um, the ways in which over historical time, our definitions, our understandings of what these racial categories are and what we call them have varied enormously. We're probably more familiar with this. Most of us in our data collection or in our policy work have utilized uh, what is called the Office of Management and Budget Statistical Directive 15, which was to provide kind of consistent categories for use uh, among federal agencies. As it says here, the, director, the directive is really to provide these standard classifications for record keeping, collection, and presentation of data on race and ethnicity for federal program administration. Note too, it says these classifications shouldn't be interpreted as scientific or anthropological in nature, nor should they be viewed as determinants of eligibility uh, for uh, federal programs. In fact, OMB Directive 15 was to just get federal agencies to utilize the same kinds of consistent categories. It found that different agencies before 1977 were doing different kinds of coding, different kinds of record keeping with respect to race and ethnicity. What I want to suggest though is um, these categories, which we still have, there's been minor modifications made in 1997, but basically these categories are still with us, um, have some different problems with respect to their construction and meaning. One, the definition of American Indian or Alaska Native as a person having origins in any of the original peoples of North Africa and uh, North America, excuse me, and who maintain cultural identification through tribal affiliation or community recognition. Many of these categories have some notion of original peoples inhabiting a particular geographic area, something which is subject to a lot of different uh, anthropological debate, by the way. Uh, Asian or Pacific Islander, person having origins in any of the original peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, or the Pacific Islands. C, which is the only um, category which is defined with an explicit racial designator, is the term black, a person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa. Now, I don't know about you, but I often wonder, what are the black racial groups of Africa? D, Hispanic, which isn't a racial category at all. In fact, it's a person of Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Central or South American, or other Spanish culture origin, regardless of race. You could be of any race. It's an ethnicity question, and it's the only one the feds are interested in. Are you Hispanic? Are you Latino? Or not? And in fact, it's filtered through a kind of colonial process as well of Spanish cultural origin. One wonders about Brazilians, of Portuguese imperialism and culture, but there's a lot of slippages here. You'll see slippages too in the indigenous category. What about some of the indigenous peoples of Central or South America? They fall out of this as well. Uh, lastly, the term white, oops, which is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, North Africa, or the Middle East. Now, what's interesting about white, of course, is that uh, in parallel structure to black, we don't define a whole person as being from the white racial groups of Europe, North Africa, or the Middle East. Nor, unlike the American Indian category, do we ask any other group to maintain cultural identification through some form of community recognition. That's only imposed on this particular kind of indigenous category. Now, um, while initially conceived to provide consistent categories, as I said, for use by federal agencies, the directive has had the unintended consequences of really shaping the very discourse of race in the United States. They constitute basically the five food groups of American multiculturalism. Um, and there's problems with this as well. There's problems with how people identify. Uh, and let me just give you a brief hint of what this is. I hope you could see this. This was actually our last census, 2010. It asked two questions. It asks, is this person of, uh, uh, question eight, is this person of Hispanic, Latin, or Spanish origin? 
and nine is what is this person's race. Now, what's interesting about this, if I told you this, is that um, beginning in 1980, in 1980, 1990, uh, 2000, uh, 2010, that it's estimated that 40% of Latinos fill out the census wrong. That's pretty striking, huh? You'd think if 40% of people fill it out wrong, something's wrong with the question. Um, <laughs> at least that's my uh, intent about it. What happens is, is that if you are Latino, you were supposed to fill out both these sections. Uh, of course, if you're not, you just say, no, I'm not. But if you did, for example, um, it asks three basic subgroups, Mexican, uh, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or some other. Uh, and then you were supposed to also come down here and check off a race. So say if you were a dark-skinned Puerto Rican, uh, the census would like to see you say, yes, I'm Puerto Rican, and come down here and check that you're black. Or you're an extremely light-skinned European of origin, Argentinian. You would write in Argentinian and put down that you're white. Now, people didn't understand that. And in fact, what many did was come down here and just check off some other race and write down what they were. And in fact, the census believes that around 94% of people who checked some of the race were actually Latino. Um, I spent some time a couple of summers ago at the Census Bureau, and would you, uh, you know what the number two outside of Latino was for some of the race, the designator? It, they told me it was Jedi. All right, for you Star Wars fans. Um, the, the point of this is that administrative definitions may not be very meaningful to the very populations they're trying to capture. And it's particularly true for immigrant populations, where people go from a country which has one set of racial classifications and understanding and comes to, come to the United States. They have to learn what race is like in the United States and how to code themselves appropriately. I want to suggest that all this is an intensely political process, and that's very true for the first uh, you know, uh, time on uh, Census 2000 and also 2010. People could check more than one box. Before then, um, the 1920 census, for example, stipulated that any mixture of white or some other race was to be reported according to the race of the person who was not white. This is the principle of hypodescent. You have a dominant or superior group and a subordinate group. Any intermixture confines you to the subordinate group. It's like the one drop rule magnified in different ways. Well, this got uh, protested, particularly beginning in the 70s, um, who uh, were protesting the single race checkoff policy. The United States, the, until uh, Census 2000, it was assumed that every one of us had a single monoracial identity. And you know you could check more than one. I'll tell you a trick too. If you fill out the census before then and you tried to fill in the, the dots on more than one, the census counted the one that was filled in uh, darker and, and skipped the other one. Um, but beginning in the 70s in particular, let me check my time here, um, a number of organizations, including the Association of Multiracial Americans, uh, as well as uh, Project Race, I love the acronym here, Project Race stands for Reclassify All Children Equally, um, actively lobbied for a separate multiracial category on Census 2000. Um, and in fact, a lot of this came from school districts in particular, where parents of quote unquote mixed race multiracial children uh, objected to the fact that their children had to make a choice or administrators made a choice for children as to how they would be racially coded. Now, not all at once, but slowly, a lot of the major civil rights organizations, such as Urban League, the National Council of La Raza, along with groups such as the National Coalition for an Accurate Count of Asian Pacific Islanders, all of them began to oppose a separate multiracial category on the US Census. And these groups feared that uh, a potential diminishment in numbers uh, and worries that a multiracial category would somehow spur debates regarding the protected status of different groups and individuals. So it's coming to a fore here during the uh, mid-1990s. 
where groups are lobbying for the separate uh, multiracial category, a number of groups are not. I mean, this gets into the social construction of race. I mean, it could be argued that well over 80, 85% of the African American population could potentially check off a multiracial box. Not that they would, but that would mean overnight we would lose who were African Americans into this kind of multiracial category. Well, after several years of intense debate, the Office of Management and Budget's Interagency Committee for the Review of Racial and Ethnic Standards uh, rejected the proposal to add a multiracial category, separate multiracial category to the census. But instead, in July of 1997, the 30 agency task force recommended that, the, uh, that racial categories um, be amended to permit multiracial Americans to mark one or more boxes when identifying themselves for the census or for other government programs. And that was adopted by Census 2000. And it was an outcome that really neither side of the debate anticipated. And it was nothing, it did really nothing to placate the concerns of those who wanted a separate multiracial box and civil rights organizations, which didn't want a box, but neither did they want multi-checkoffs multi too, because it allows to a lot of interesting kinds of statistical dilemmas with respect to data gathering. My point here is that the ever-changing racial and ethnic definitions and categories used by the census dramatically reveal the social constructedness and the fluidity of race. Racial and ethnic categories can be seen as the effects of political interpretation and struggle. And in turn, the categories themselves have political effects. Um, I'm gonna leave this to get into my second half uh, sorry, section, but before I do, I wanna just show you something really briefly, and if we have time to talk about it. Uh, I don't know if you can see this very well, but uh, Census 2020 is probably gonna look different again. And uh, the census has been conducting what are called the alternative questionnaire experiments, uh, focus group interviews, surveys to see. And this is one possible format where in fact it just lists, it uh, eliminates the ethnicity and, and folds in Hispanics, Latinos into a kind of racial category. So there's only one question, not two. And it has open-ended boxes where people can fill in much more specificity of what they want to. Um, so uh, you check all, you could even, for, for the first time, both whites and blacks can also specify uh, a kind of uh, a other ethnicity or label they want to, want, might want to claim uh, being Dominican or, or Haitian or something, okay. Um, Given these kinds of, there's a continuing debate going on. I want to shift here um, also within the sort of um, the sciences as well. And generally in the realm of the social sciences or in terms of policy, uh, the dominant mantra is really that race is a social construction, not a biological one. And we try to part very um, dramatically with the kinds of eugenic notions of race, of scientific racism, uh, eugenics, of course, was very popular in the United States and England in the 19th, early 20th century, uh, but fell on the, uh, on the harsh realities of the Nazi race science and became disavowed after World War II. So we've been moving much more towards a kind of social definition of race, not a biological one. And in fact, the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001 uh, said flatly in its editorial, race is biologically meaningless. But in fact, in the wake of the Human Genome Project, geneticists and others are engaged in a very vigorous debate about whether race is a meaningful and useful genetic concept. One of these geneticists is Neil Reich. Um, Neil Reich used to be at Stanford, now he's at uh, UC San Francisco. And uh, he's been at the center of this debate for the past several years. Uh, Neil Reich says that genetic differences have arisen among people from different continents and that the concept of race is a valid way to categorize these differences. He uses the term race, in fact, to refer to geographically based ancestry and uh, clusters the human population into five major groups, Sub-Saharan Africans, Caucasians, which include people from Europe, the Indian subcontinent, 
and the Middle East, Asians, including people from China, the Philippines, and Siberia, Pacific Islanders, and Native Americans. And this recognition of race, he asserts, is particularly important for understanding genetic susceptibility to certain diseases and receptivity to certain drug treatments. And indeed, this debate, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put Neorish up there, the, uh, is, finds its, uh, this debate finds its sharpest expression in the emergent field of pharmacogenomics. The ultimate goal of pharmacogenomics is to be able to analyze every individual, every one of our uh, genome, so that a precise type of medication and in what dose could be prescribed for that individual patient. What we have, presumably, is really uh, tailor-made drugs, tailor-made medical interventions for a specific condition. But so far, even though the cost is falling dramatically, um, geneticists cannot sequence individual genomes in a quick and cost-effective way. And given this, a question has arose in the field of pharmacogenomics, is race, is race a handy proxy for making a determination on an individual's a patient, how an individual patient will fare with a particular drug? And the question is really not an abstract or hypothetical one. A drug called Bidil has been introduced as the first ethnic designer drug. Uh, can I ask how many people have heard of Bidil? A few people? Okay. Um, Here's the ad for Bidil. Nitromed, the biotech firm which produces Bidil, is marketing the drug to African Americans who suffer from congestive heart failure. And the drug is not new, but a combination of two generic drugs that first uh, tested for heart failure more than 20 years ago. And the drug was originally rejected for approval by the Food and Drug Administration um, at the end of the 1990s. But researchers at Nitromed went back into their data and argued that the clinical trials suggested that the drug seemed to work better for blacks than it did for whites. Actually, this was very slim evidence, I'm going to tell you, and the statistical differences were very minor in this case. But here's the ad for that. Person that's looking a little like Bill Cosby, huh, on that <laughs> ad. I'll probably get taken off that ad soon. Um, some medical researchers feel that Bidil sets a dangerous precedent, precedent by linking race and genetics in ways that could distract from our understanding of other causes of disease. Nitromed claims that African Americans have a higher rate of heart failure than the American population as a whole. But is the cause of that genetic? Looking at African Americans in hypertension offers an interesting case. Some geneticists have argued that the higher rates of hypertension among blacks than whites are due to genetic differences in salt retention or in renin levels in the kidneys. But one study found that the one thing that correlated most strongly with blood pressure levels was skin color. And among black subjects, the darker the skin, the higher the degree of hypertension. As sociologist Troy Duster, who's done extensive work on the race and genetics debate says, if you follow me around Nordstrom's and put me in jail at nine times the rate of whites and refuse to give me a bank loan, I might get hypertensive. <laughs> What's generating my increased blood pressure are the social forces at play, not my DNA. What all this suggests is that we must be very careful indeed not to make a quick leap from phenotype to genotype. And given the past history of racial thinking, it's important that we subject the notion of genetic racial differences to very close scrutiny, since racial differences are easily misinterpreted and exploited. And this debate, by the way, I'm just going to go through this part quickly, um, is going to be a kind of uh, continually be a loaded one in the coming years, among other things in the uh, field of forensics. For all of you enamored by the numerous CSI television spin-offs, uh, we have molecular biologist Tony Frudakis, uh, formerly of DNA Print Genomics, who came to fame in a Baton Rouge serial murder case in 2003. Frudakis' claims for forensic science is that uh, we can determine a murderer's race by analyzing their DNA. We can determine race by analyzing a person's DNA. Um, among other things, 
there's been this increased popularity um, spurred on by people like Oprah Winfrey and Skip Gates, Henry Louis Gates, among others, who have helped to inspire a growing popular quest by individuals to find their roots through ostensibly scientific means. And there are now over two dozen companies that market genetic ancestry tests. Um, lastly here, I want to talk specifically about the case of Wayne Joseph and DNA print genomics. Um, Wayne Joseph uh, was in his uh, 50s and a high school principal in Chino who uh, was known as a, a black advocate and writer. He wrote for magazines like Newsweek, occasions. And some years back, he saw an ethnic DNA test on 60 Minutes and decided to spend $600 to find out his exact percentage of black blood. So he got a testing kit from, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to hold off on it. He got a testing kit from DNA Print Genomics, swabbed his mouth per the instructions, and set off the DNA sample for analysis. Um, so uh, the results he got back really floored him. These are the results. It turned out that Mr. Joseph was found to be 57% Indo-European, 39% Native American, 4% East Asian, and 0% African. I like to comment his son said. His son said, Dad, you mean for 50 years you've been passing for black? <laughs> Joseph himself flatly advises against the test. He says, you don't want to know. It's like a genie coming out of a bottle. You can't put it back in. Genie indeed. Now, the problem of racial classification, if there's so many problems with racial classification, uh, why do we keep classifying people by race? And what does that mean? And in fact, this brings us back to colorblindness in the last part of my talk. Um, over the past two decades, there's been really a concerted attempt by political conservatives to ban the collection of racial data and information. Government policies that utilize racial categories have been increasingly criticized for promoting color consciousness and subverting the ideology and practice of color blindness. On October 7, 2003, Californians went to the voting booth to recall a recently re-elected governor, elect his successor, who became, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, and vote on an initiative called Proposition 54, the so-called Racial Privacy Initiative. Proposition 54 was sponsored by former University of California Regent Ward Connerly. Many of you know him. He was one of the main architects of California's anti-affirmative action, Proposition 209, and of Michigan's Proposition 2. Ward Connolly it phenotypically is African American. He actually describes himself as a multiracial individual, which is interesting. Um, and Connolly has steadfastly believed that the abolition of racial classification is essential to realizing, for us to realize a colorblind society. He said, and this was in the voter pamphlet argument, which he wrote for California, he says, dare we forget the lessons of history Classification systems were invented to keep certain groups in their place and deny them full rights. Or as he editorialized in the Chronicle in 2003, racial categories give credence to the dangerous view held by many that race is a fixed biological reality. Okay. So what Proposition 54 sought to do was to write into the California State Constitution a ban on racial data collection. Um, it would add this Article I to the California Constitution saying that the state shall not classify any individual by race, ethnicity, color, or national origin in the operation of public education, public contracting, or public employment. Going on, for purposes of this section, uh, classifying by race, so these categories, um, uh, was, uh, you know, is seen as the act of sorting, separate, sort, uh, separating, sorting, or organizing by race, ethnicity, color, or national origin, including but not limited to inquiring, profiling, or collecting such data on government forms. Right. Let me say, this was pretty deceptive in getting this on the ballot. There were a lot of communities of color that signed on to this, thinking that this would eliminate profiling on the part of the police 
for the California Highway Patrol, uh, when it actually was a much more insidious way of eliminating all sorts of data collection. Um, so uh, the coalition that was that mobilized in opposition to Proposition 4, 20, uh, 54 was um, faced with a kind of a, a dilemma. It's that given the composition of the California's electorate, which is still is, uh, is, is mostly white, how would they influence white voters in the face of what seemed to be a racially polarizing initiative? And in fact, they had lost in former initiatives such as the Prop 209 on affirmative action and also Prop 187, which denied immigrants uh, basic medical and educational access in the state of California. So they conducted these focus group interviews and decided that uh, they should focus on health issues. And in particular, there was one exemption that was made in Prop 54, which said that the otherwise lawful classification of medical research subjects and patients shall be exempt from this section. I should mention there was another exemption too. Law enforcement officials made them say that they can still identify suspects in terms of race. Uh, and in fact, that they could do this and that they didn't have to, uh, it's got a longer thing, which says that the police or, or other agencies don't have to keep records of who they arrest, however, on, on reaching traffic stops and all this. So you wouldn't know who was being profiled. Uh, so it was like, having their cake and eating it too, which was very interesting. But in this instance, it was this health issue. Health researchers said the wording was too vague. They viewed the term medical research subjects as volunteers in medical experiments, not individuals responding to surveys, questionnaires, interviews, or epidemiological research. So opponents argued that data on race, opponents to 54, that data on race, typically extracted from public health and other records collected by public agencies, would now be unavailable or off limits under Proposition 54, which would dramatically affect targeting population groups for risk and tailoring appropriate programs for outreach and preventive care. And the coalition played up this health issues in its campaign ads and frequently mentioned was the fact that race-specific data collection revealed that white women were diagnosed with higher rates of breast cancer than other women implying that whites had as much to lose as people of color if the initiative were to pass. So it focused on these biological kinds of readings, uh, genetic readings of the case. And in fact, it rallied the you know, California Medical Association. All these groups came out opposed to Proposition 54 in the wake of this kind of line of argument. And in the end, Proposition 54 was defeated but as uh, political scientist Daniel Hosang argues, that victory was predicated on an important shift in the political discourse of race. He argues that the Civil Rights Coalition really advanced the notion of race as a marker of biological difference rather than as a signifier or category of social difference and stratification. He concludes that one of the surreal aspects of the campaign was witnessing a conservative libertarian, that is Connerly, offer an analysis of the historically contingent basis of racial categories, while the putative civil rights advocates flirted with notions of biolog biologism, biologism and genetically conditioned racial difference. That's the irony. Uh, and indeed, the discursive claims advanced by both sides of the Proposition 54 debate provides a very telling, if not ironic example of the choices made and the positions established by utilizing specific notions of race as a signifier of difference. Well, given the confusion surrounding the concept of race, why don't we simply abolish racial classification? But the reality is, without some form of racial record keeping, we are unable to empirically observe institutional patterns um, institutional patterns of racial inequality with respect to things like income, wealth, educational opportunity, healthcare, among other important indicators of well-being and life chances. Empirical studies of racial inequality or disparities illustrate the continuing need for race data. The Institute of Medicine's study, Unequal Treatment, in 2003, found that 
Even if you controlled a for insurance company coverage and ability to pay, there were stark differences by race in terms of preventative care, diagnostics, and treatment, no matter what the disease in question was. In one study of 1.7 million patients, blacks received major therapeutic procedures less often than whites in 37 of 77 medical conditions. Here's another interesting thing to highlight uh, the passage of civil rights laws and why you need racial data. You know, we passed the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which said that mortgage lenders could not discriminate by race in their home mortgages. But in fact, it wasn't until data collection laws were passed in the 1980s that we were able to discern what the patterns of lending were. And in that case, it was found, of course, that loan rejection rates were twice as high for African Americans with the same income portfolio as for whites, of course, uh, with uh, keeping income portfolios consistent. Blacks were rejected at twice the rates. This example, among others, illustrates the continuing need to maintain some form of racial classification and racial data. This does not mean we can have an accurate, precise, or scientific form of racial classification. Racial classifications and the meanings and, and definitions we impart to them change over time. They cannot, however, simply be dispensed with. In a racially stratified society, social concepts of race matter, and we need to examine patterns and trends. During the Proposition 54 debate, Ken Pruitt, who was the former director of the Census Bureau, Ken Pruitt did uh, Census 2000, sent me a short piece he wrote on, racial pri on the Racial Privacy Initiative, and he said, I'm happy to join Ward Connerly in welcoming a colorblind society, but I don't want to be blindfolded as it arrives. And I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, wonderful presentation. We do have some time for questions, so if people would like to ask some questions, um, we have about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Thanks, Ed. Uh, don't be shy. Do we have a mic for folks? Hi, I had a question um, about your last point that it's important to use racial categories to identify um, institutional racism uh, or institutional patterns of racial inequality. Then how is it, but then at the same time you said it's, we can't expect to um, accurately classify or categorize, but then for the purposes of that, um, of those records, how would you how do we go about figuring out how to make categories that make sense? Right. You know, it's also all of these, is this, is that working, Brandon? I'm, I'm coming on? Am I clear? Um, you know, um, what I want to say about that is that we, if we cannot have any sort of precise, scientific, or fixed racial categories forever, but deciding uh, about the content or definition of racial categories is a policy decision. We may want to observe certain trends. We may want to say there are specific forms of othering, social othering going on in our society that we want to acknowledge. What are salient categories for that? Might be gender, might be sexuality, might be age, might be race. In the case of race, what might be the significant kinds of groups we think may be disadvantaged? We may want to know what the loan rejection rates for African Americans are. We might not want to know what the loan rejection rates for Scandinavian Americans are. That's a policy call. So all I'm suggesting here is that um, we be attentive to the fact that this can never be fixed and, and, and written in stone, but in fact is a constantly evolving process, an iteration of understanding what are the patterns and trends, what are the kinds of discriminatory patterns that may be occurring, 
who may be the groups that we perceive to be uh, the subjects of that, and to try to figure out ways of coding that. Thank you for uh, the wonderful talk. Keith Parker from NC State University. I just had a quick question of, obviously the United States is unique in our development of our perception of race, but in comparison to other industrialized nations, particularly Europe, who's dealt with a um, religious and ethnic issue, particularly with Southeastern Europe, could you maybe talk for a minute and give us some, some comparison of classifications of race in other industrialized nations as compared to how we do it. Right, that's, that's part of a longer discussion, but let me just make a quick reference here. For example, France does not ask about race in its national censuses. Uh, and accordingly, uh, France has no racial problems. But uh, <laughs> my point here is that this is the dilemma of the color blindness, right? In other words, if you don't see it, you don't, you don't track it, you don't know it. And so it, for the United States to adopt a similar posture, and believe me, there's a lot of people who would like to see the race question off the census. Uh, Newt Gingrich, before his fall from grace, was a real uh, uh, advocate around multiracial, uh, and, and his, his argument about mixed race was that it showed the indeterminacy of all race, that it was just such, such an open question, we shouldn't ask the race question at all. But my point being is that in censuses which don't track race, for example, in countries like France, you're unable to observe those patterns, and it certainly doesn't mean that France is a colorblind society. In other societies, however, the kinds of uh, major cleavages and divisions may be organized around other notions, around um, ethnicity, around language, and so forth. But um, that's something on a global scale. What's amazing to me is that if you actually look at, at global censuses or global racial categories, there's incredible variation within, within it. You know, within uh, Latin America, for example, in places like Brazil, there's a whole host, a whole large range of, of racial categories. Um, it's so confusing that, in, in fact, uh, you know, most people would give, you, you'd assign several levels. But what's really striking in the Brazilian case, too, is depending on your color, your skin color, on a spectrum of light to uh, dark, you and one of your siblings a sister or brother may be seen as racially of two different groups and, and self-identify in terms of being a member of two different racial groups, which is incomprehensible in the context of a kind of um, much more uh, rigid racial classification we have in the United States. Hi, um, so my question is, this is a really broader view of racial formation in the society, and I, I guess everybody is so just amazed by all the broader view about racial formation, so we don't know how to ask question right now. Um, so my question is, because we are all educators and uh, researchers, academic researchers, in specifically in education, so what's your, what's your insight or what's your thought on color blindness and how that affect education specifically or educational policy specifically? If, if there is nothing, what are the directions that we can start to look at or pay it more attention? Thank uh -huh, you. Uh -huh. That's a good question. Um, there's a couple of things. I'll, I'm gonna break this down into two quick parts. One is around uh, the research itself. I mean, certainly by problematizing the racial categories, you run the risk of having difficulties in time series data. You know, what group X means in 1880 may not mean what it means in 2015. Uh, so, but I think the problem with uh, most researchers around race or social science research about race is that it doesn't uh, deal significantly with the, the what do you mean by race. Uh, and what does it mean in particular historical circumstances? So it's almost as if race is a given. It's, it's, an, it's like you are what you are. You know, you're seen as 
um, you're black, and then you know you code black, and you co correlate that with educational achievement, with uh, delinquency, with truancy rates, everything else, without thinking about what do you mean uh, when you're using that in any particular instance. So the thing is to first problematize, at least make note of that in your research about how you're seeing that. The other thing about color blindness is I think there's a a way in which um, um, much of this uh, sort of gets played out too in the, well, let's take even the classroom in which uh, teachers, for example, who think they may be doing the right thing by trying to sort of ignore or, or minimize race end up sort of reproducing uh, large forms of racial subordination. And here, for example, uh, thinking about um, when is, uh, issues of race come up that the, the, and racial difference, that teachers don't directly um, talk about that, but instead may sort of slough it aside and say, oh, you know, we're all, we're all the same, we're all human, and you shouldn't say those things. What makes you have those kinds of stereotypes about other people? That's bad, you know? Instead of really examining the content of what those stereotypes and perceptions are among their students. What does it mean, and how can we collectively sort of work out uh, how we see that and what that might mean? Um, the, I mean? Those are like, you know, only two small instances of this, but I, the, what, what I fear more or less is the ways in which people think the best way to transcend race and racism is simply to be colorblind, to get beyond it, to somehow ignore it, that it's like uh, someone said uh, once that uh, uh, it's like a, a scab. If you keep picking on it, it'll never get better. Instead of really thinking about what would that mean for the kinds of research we do, what would that mean for the kinds of policy suggestions that go on not only at the classroom, but at other levels as well? How do we sort of be race conscious? How do we recognize race? And how do we recognize its impact with respect to some of the patterns and trends that we're trying to observe. Um, you're probably in a better situation than I am to think about uh, how race and racism uh, plays out throughout uh, both the curriculum and with respect to administration. But uh, those are the things we need to address. You know, why is it that black and Latino kids uh, are summarily sort of suspended or dismissed at incredible rates um, throughout very different levels? throughout K through 12. What's going on? We have to think about what's going on. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, sure. Melinda Lemke, uh, UT Austin Ed Policy. I, I was wondering if you could um, try to apply this to gender issues. Uh -huh. um, we um, clearly can't force our queer students and queer adults to self-identify, but at the same time, um, we miss out on a lot of rich empirical data in terms of discrimination that's blatantly happening in our schools and yeah. in society. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about how from a policy or practitioner perspective we can begin to address that issue. Someone should look this up, uh, but I heard that it's either in New Zealand or Australia, in some of the census or coding, uh, they've gone beyond the sex gender as male, female. You could have a third choice or you could pick choices. And it would seem to me that incre increasingly, uh, that's where we need to, we've been locked into a rigid binary of what we perceive sex gender to be in the, in the United States. And indeed, uh, to talk about transgendered people, uh, to talk about, um, uh, as well as issues around uh, sexuality and, and, and sexual orientation, uh, it just seems like that's important to do. So that's another thing, you know, we, we, we rigidify the categories. As a result of the rigidity and problematic nature of the categories, we can explore the variation we'd like to see. So I think, that, I think that's a, a, a next movement, you know. You know, no, actually, no question you ask on censuses is very clear. Even age varies across the globe. In societies which uh, really value the elderly and, and venerate them in their culture, people say they're older than they are. And in the United States, people always make claims that they're younger than they are. <laughs> so um, it shows you the slipperiness of all those categories in some sense. But I think it, it, it's particularly important that we do introduce these kinds of things. Now, um, 
also assuring that people who do want to self-identify in those terms uh, are not rendered vulnerable is another question. How is that data uh, being used, you know? And how will it circulate in different social domains? That becomes a very important issue. Um, but I think it's really important for us to start thinking about that. The categories we, we are using may be um, quite useless. I'll just make one other point about this. This is true between the social science and the kind of medical research. A lot of medical researchers say that the OMB Statistical Directive 15 categories, that oftentimes if they receive federal grants, they have to report according to those things, make no sense uh, with respect to the kind of variation they're trying to observe among their sample populations. And yet they're sort of forced into the kind of the, the, uh, the reporting model in terms of, you know, was the sample diverse? Was this, you know, they're using categories imported from one area that may not make sense in another. So it's a, it is a dilemma. Well, thank you for this topic. It's, I think it's really important, especially for kids in schools. Uh, uh, where, where's some of our, I, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> There's a disembodied voice there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The spirits are in the room now. Um, I have a great nephew who was in kindergarten, and the family just assumed he knew he was black. You know, he's biracial, but he's very, very fair. And he found out at school through his kindergarten teacher that he was indeed a little black boy, and it kind of shook him. And he came home and he told his mother, you know, they were, I guess it was Black History Month, and they were talking about Martin Luther King. And he goes, oh, like him. And the teacher goes, and you. You know, so I'm thinking, you know, what should the role of teacher training be in sensitivity and helping kids to, you know, realize their race. And then another incident I had as a researcher, I was in a school and I had the kids fill out, you know, their categories as to what they perceived themselves to be. Mm -hmm. And I had two little girls that I thought were black girls or African American, and that was nowhere in their description. They claimed it nowhere, even though they were multiracial and biracial. So I think that that whole identity piece and being sensitive and helping kids to understand is important, not only for categorization, but you know, if they're going out as adults and you know, like there are implications, like you said, with the racism, how do we prepare kids for that if they identify as one thing, but then they're being treated as another in another way? Yeah, that's really tough. You know, in fact, in some ways, some of these forms, the census, uh, would be a lot more revealing if it asked two questions. It asked you, how do you self-identify? And then it would ask you a question, how do other people identify you? And in this, in this instance, it, that, that, that's the kind of distinction. In other words, the thing to be sensitive towards is the ways in which people see themselves may be extremely different from the ways that others perceive them. And oftentimes, uh, their life chances may be very highly shaped by how people see them. And so um, it's, it's a kind of ways in which uh, people need to bring those kinds of differences out and negotiate them. Uh, um, I have a friend of mine who's actually um, from England. He's, um, he's uh, uh, black, uh, he's racially mixed, black and white. And he says he goes around the globe and everybody reads him differently depending on the country he is. And he has this whole litany of stuff. When I'm in Greece, people see me like this. When I'm in Morocco, people see me like this. And it's like, he's just like a racial everyman, you know what I mean? People see him from uh, what they want to do. Now, how that, how, now with how people can, I, I think I don't have great, sort of answers for you about the strategic approach, particularly in the classroom, to handle those discussions. You know? I, I just think that one of the ways that certainly kids of color often get coded in certain respects are asked to, you know, oh, we're doing, you know, Cinco de Mayo and so and so is Mexican and we'll ask him something, even though Cinco de Mayo is even celebrated in Mexico, but you know. <laughs> so the, the point is, is how to sort of break out of that kind of model of multiculturalism and assume a kind of essentialism, you know, that this boy is this, so he's the kind of representative of the culture. That's got to that's gotta go, obviously. But the other part of that, too, is, um, is, to, is, to, is to examine difference, to discuss difference. How are people being othered? What are the kinds of of representations, what are the kinds of 
images, uh, what are the kinds of things that come up uh, when um, people are, tr uh, are grappling with what they perceive to be difference? And I think that's, that's a hard conversation to have. It is. Okay. Are we almost up? Are we up? Oh, got one more question. I'm Colleen Capper from University of Wisconsin-Madison. I appreciate your talk a lot. I just think that on a really practical example, locally, um, we see often um, uh, white students and Asian students combine to compare those, like, for example, an achievement to other uh, students of color. But in the uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, that part of the country, you know, the Hmong Southeast Asian population, we have a, a very um, high population. So my, my students all do equity audits in their, in their schools. And even though the, the district doesn't ask for this data, I have them break down Asian, Southeast Asian, at, at, compared to students who are not Southeast Asian as a, yet another category because addressing the point you just made because all the statistics show us that those, the Southeast Asian students are really um, struggling as well as obviously having lots of assets in the schools but also struggling in a lot of different areas. So it's just a local example of pointing out like what additional data do we need here that can help us um, you know, really move forward in schools. So I really appreciate what you said. I guess also um, Michael Malley and I have a piece coming out in EAQ where we uh, studied the social justice programs, leadership preparation programs across the country. And um, one of the uh, less than 50% of those programs actually address sexual identity in their, in their preparation. Um, and so obviously that's a huge issue if you call yourself social justice, but less than half actually address it in their program. But one of our very practical suggestions is, is that on enrollment forms into your university or into your program is to add the point that the uh, gal up there um, said, is to add female, uh, male, transgender, and then also the sexual identity question along with what you're talking about, knowing that students are gonna be protected if identified. But mm -hmm. if you can't be identified, it's, it's, the points that you've made are so good. If you can't even be identified, you know, you, I mean, you, you actually do not count. I mean, we actually don't care how you're doing. And so um, I just think that's a really important point. I, I appreciate you, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thanks. One more? Okay. Oh. Hi, I'm Jeff Gannity, Washington, D.C. Um, I worked on the issue of Common Core last year. Could you uh, speak a little louder? Hi, I'm yes, Jeff Kennedy, Washington, D.C. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I worked on the issue of Common Core last year. Uh, and what I found interesting was that the Department of Education had started massive data collection, but it had not decided what it was going to do with the data. <laughs> And only when questioned by Congress, the Senate, did they come up with what would be the best practices of how to use that data. How can you collect data without deciding what you're going to use it for? I'm, I'm sorry, I got to catch the last part of the question. So what, what? How can you collect data without deciding first what you're going to use it for. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's the problem. It, that seems insane, in fact, to uh, begin that process without some acknowledgement on the front end of thinking about what are going to be the patterns, what might be the observable categories that uh, might be significant. So let's get back to the previous question, in fact. Uh, simply using a category of Asian Americans in a school district may not give you the breakdown in data that you may need to discern significant differences between the Hmong or the Laotian population and those of, of other East Asian groups, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans, for example. So in other words, on the front end, you've got to make some calls regarding what you think are going to be some important distinctions and differences. Um, because that will suggest the kinds of categories you need to employ and the kinds of data you need to collect. It does seem kind of crazy to engage in a massive data gathering effort without knowing on the front end what the goals of that data gathering initiative are with respect to translating uh, that massive data into some sort of policy. I don't know. Okay. 
Thank you for your attendance. And again, let's give uh, one more thank you to Dr. Elmi for a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Thanks Dan.